Thank you, Chair. Uh, could everybody hear me? Uh, thank you for that kind introduction and for giving me the opportunity of just giving you a brief overview of the work that's currently underway for developing uh, an integrated strategy for managing flood risk in the River Hull Valley. And it's perhaps appropriate that I followed the past speaker because uh, some of what you've talked about at Belford is some of the things that we'll also be talking about. Um, up until December this year, whilst people in this room I know fully understand the impact of flood risk, uh, at presentations like this I've had to use quite a lot of photographs to remind people exactly what we're talking about. And we all know from seeing the TV and stories we've been hearing about how severe it is in the south and southwest area. But just as a reminder, we've heard about 5,000 properties being affected with the current problems. Back in 2007, there were over 15,000 properties in the Hull and East Riding area. So just to put it in context, it is always bad for people to suffer from flooding. And the fact that it's raised the profile once again gives us the opportunity to take these sorts of projects forward and get the support that we're looking for. Um, what I'm going to do very quickly is talk about how we've gathered together a number of agencies building on work that's already been done um, to really fully understand exactly what is in what we call the Natural River Hull Valley. Now, I don't know how many of you were able to see the display from the River Hull Heritage Group that was outside whilst we had lunch. Absolutely fantastic piece of work. Uh, it saved my team doing an awful lot of digging because it provides a level of understanding, uh, not just people like yourselves who live and farm in the area, but people who potentially are at risk. So it is a, an absolutely fantastic piece of work. We're grateful for everything they've done and we're very keen to continue supporting that. Because for no other reason, it brings uh, to the forefront of people's minds that the area that we're looking at is very much like the Dutch model, as they have in Holland. It is a very heavily modified system, relying on engineered structures, channels, pumping stations, all sorts of equipment. If we didn't have that, it would very quickly resort back to the original floodplain and salt marshes. And I think with all the various reorganisations of management responsibility, some of that has perhaps been forgotten. So what do we mean by the River Hull? It's the area on the slide bounded in red, and we're calling it the Natural River Hull because it isn't just the river itself. It's the area to the east, the Plain of Holderness, and that to the west. It's 380,000 square miles, in which, as was mentioned this morning, there are 130,000 properties at the second highest risk of flooding in the country. Now, it is affected by many sources of flood risk, and it's very complex, and that's really what the study is that we're engaged with at the moment. But what we've tried to do is to simplify it with this slide, and in the centre, you'll see that we have the River Hull itself, which is a canalised river at high level, much higher than the surrounding uh, land, that takes the water arising from the Yorkshire worlds through streams and watercourses discharging through the city of Hull. Now the areas to the east and west are much lower lying and they rely on the system that we've just described and the history of which is outside on the display. It relies on canalised systems, purposely drainage channels to take water uh, and again get that down either up into the river itself, if it'll allow it to do that, or directly into the River Humber. Now there are two other key functions in managing the flood risk in this part of the world and that is the groundwater itself. We sit on a, a large chalk area that acts as a sponge and we know from back in 2007 where the ground was particularly saturated that everything ran off straight away causing flooding problems. Uh, we have had some significant events since. We've already heard about a near miss in 2012 of a drought. We were very, very close to a near miss in 2012 of another major flooding incident because the groundwater was particularly high and we had a series of not particularly strong storm events but a number of 
successive events which gradually built up and there was nowhere for that water to go. And perhaps last, and the one that's at the front of people's minds, is the impact of the Humber itself and the tidal surge that we saw in December. And one of the things that the team are looking at is the impact of climate change and the ever-increasing sea levels. Because for every millimetre rise in the sea itself, that is a period of time where which the water from the catchment cannot easily drain into the river as, that river continu- as the sea level continues to rise. So that's a, a very simplified way of trying to represent what it is we're about. And I suppose the key thing, and I mentioned it earlier about the various administrative changes, there are actually five flood risk management authorities who have a responsibility for some or part of managing that risk. And they're shown in the logos across the bottom, the East Riding of Yorkshire Environment Agency, Hill City Council, Beverley and North Homeless Internal Drainage Board, and Yorkshire Water. And they are effectively the project board that I'm now working for. Because following the publication of the Environment Agency plans for the river, um, Graham Stewart, the MP, formed the River Hull Advisory Board. Um, you might not be able to make out all the detail there. But building on some of the comments, feedback and reaction to that, it was seen necessary to bring all those flood risk management authorities together and to get them to work together. We hear this so many times about multi-agency working, but there was a genuine need to actually demonstrate what can happen and avoid people working in silos and just doing their little piece. That board has uh, authority to act on behalf of each of those agencies, and within it there are representatives from some of the other key stakeholders. There are too many to mention today, but I will just mention three of them. The National Farmers Union, we have a representative. We have representatives from the uh, Regional Flood and Coastal Committee, but perhaps key to it is a representative uh, of the community, the community representative, And alongside that, we have a small core group of people who we, as the project develops, will inform and advise on where we are with the project so that when we get to the end, there are no surprises. But more importantly, people can see what information has been used. It's signed off and agreed. And then at the end of the study, we can genuinely go to formal consultation and people can see where some of the decisions have been taken from. A lot of work has been done already. Uh, This is just a a simplification of all the uh, work that the Environment Agency carried out, just looking at the river flooding itself, the fluvial flooding. And that work started way back in 2004 and culminated in the uh, publication of a draft strategy in 2010. What we are now looking to do is to integrate into that work the impacts from surface water, from groundwater and the tidal impacts. And we're using three separate organisations to to carry out the hydraulic modelling, the technical environmental assessment and the economic appraisal. And we heard earlier today that there are certain rules and regulations that we have to comply with and demonstrate what the benefit of every pound of investment would be. We're actually pushing a wee bit on that. What we're trying to do is to demonstrate to uh, not just use those simple rules, but also what the overall impact to the community is, so that these things are looked at in an integrated way. We believe it's wrong to just look at what the cost of the loss to a particular area of field would be if that field is actually also protecting uh, and properties to the north of the city of Hull. And we firmly believe that the modelling would show that. And one of the reasons why currently we're not having to grapple with flooding in the city is that natural sponge was, fortunately, fairly empty. And so we've been able to absorb quite a lot of that. So it, it is really important that these things are looked at in the whole and not just parceled up into individual packages of work. The board themselves have signed up to something called the Project Acceptance Criteria. And by that, each agency understands that there are certain uh, pieces of data, certain simulations, certain data sets that everyone will sign off 
so that whatever the result will look like, and we're currently forecasting to report this towards the end of this year, um, we then don't want people saying, well, I didn't agree to this, I didn't agree to that. So it has been quite important, a lot of work has been done in ensuring that that governance is in place through the life of the study. So what will it look like? Um, I'm not a modeler, I'm an engineer by profession, but if we try to simplify it, it's a representation of all those different sources of flood risk uh, in a computer model. And it was uh, helpful that the Belford case study was also mentioned, because again, modeling is used. And it's about incorporating all that data and information and producing data that is then, and perhaps most importantly, tested for real in the field. Now, some of our earlier work is represented on this slide. It's just uh, a plan view of the bulk of the valley and the dark blue areas are those areas predicted to flood, just looking at the fluvial, the river flooding. The light blue areas are those which we know from data collection actually flooded in the 2007 event. So clearly there are uh, areas where we need to tie in that interrelationship between what's happening underneath, over the land, not just from the river itself. That's the key thing which we will use in going out and talking to the community, to representatives, so that they can understand how that information is being uh, provided and understood. Because there's a challenge always put back that modelling is a bit of a techie world, and if you're not a modeler, you don't understand it. So one of the key tasks we've got as a team is to turn that modelling data into real information that people can see and understand. Steve, I think we are going to have to okay. wind it up again. Okay, well I'll wind it up on this very last slide. Um, the, the whole basis of integrated catchment management is not just around coming up with an answer that people want. It's around giving you the tools and the information to fully understand what's happening in the area, but more importantly then look to secure funding, uh, not just in the UK but from Europe, because you can demonstrate through evidence, through good evidence, uh, how you've gone about the study. But more importantly, uh, and this is really key to the people in this audience, it's about fully understanding what the real uh, operational need is to maintain the system that we've got already. This is not just about putting in nice new shiny pumps. It's about fully understanding what we need to maintain that drainage system, who's best placed to look after it and ensure that it's there for the future. Thank you.